so yeah, so this is uh, and wee, <laughs> it's exciting. Um, this is uh, yeah, this is we're driving the smart grid, um, talking about a lot of different things about packet radios that relate to utilities. Um, and uh, yeah, this is yeah. I'm Nathan Keltner. Uh, I work with Sean on our uh, security assessments team, do penetration testing stuff like that as our uh, normal job. Occasionally, we get um, fun engagements like one that sort of led to this talk. Um, I uh, uh, also do some development for the Metasploit project. Um, Sean gives me a hard time because I my <laughs> my hardware hacking skills prior to this project primarily included mod modding Xboxes and things along those lines. Yep. So yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm a principal consultant in uh, Fishnet's security assessments team. Um, also, you know, primarily we do network web, you know, physical social engineering, pen testing, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I was I, I worked at a VCR repair shop in college, so that was my as my primary qualifications for you know, electrical engineering and such. Um, and I am I am in fact provably remarkably resistant to sustained 110 volt bursts. Um, we've. We have, we have proved this numerous times. Now it does depend on the amperage, so you know, preferably like sub, you know, sub 200 amp or so. But uh, yeah, sustained. yeah, yeah. Sustained. How sustained? A few, a few seconds, you know. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the things that we were doing, we were working with live electric meters and live other live devices and stuff. And these things would, a lot of them would have like a capacitor on the board that stepped it down to five volt. And I'm like, oh no, I can JTAG that. It's, yeah, it's just right there. That's all five <laughs> volt, you know. And there's like this big freaking capacitor right next to it. Oh, oh, not right there. No, that's yeah, that's 110. <laughs> so, so yeah. So it, basically, this is about talking about uh, both sort of smart grid and dumb grid radio. Uh, which is just sort of all this wireless technology that plugs all of the, the uh, different types of utility systems together. Um, and not just actually you know, meters, and, and a lot of people talk a lot about AMI, but this is about sort of all of the things that people are using for the wireless communication channels across the grid. And, and that also applies to gas, water, lots of other things. Yeah, primarily, um, there's lots of open standards. I mean, this stuff has been around for a long time. Uh, you can find uh, documentation from, say, ANSI and some other people. They will sell you uh, the various, um, uh, you know, uh, so similar to like RFCs for these SCADA protocols that'll tell you how all this stuff works. Um, but there's a fair amount of, you know, vendor special sauce that kind of gets tacked on all around this and inside this. And um, so anytime you touch any one of these devices, um, you always have a mixture of uh, interesting things that, that you can you know, look and find anywhere and then random you know, proprietary, um, proprietary stuff from, from these vendors, primarily uh, in the RF space, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, which is why we want to kind of you know, point a lot of this stuff out is that it, these guys are very much still in this model of you know, culturally sort of thinking about InfoSec and all of that. It hasn't been as applicable to, to this particular industry. So, they have a lot of the kind of things that you would see in 90s like software security you know, uh, you know, data sheets and stuff where, where they describe like the proprietary encryption, patented proprietary encryption as, a, as an asset you know, or, 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 or you know, secret proprietary radio protocols and things like that. And, and that's, that's actually used as a selling point. You, know, and, and you can go out to you know, AMI vendors and utility vendor sites and see that you know, as, as a security asset. And unfortunately, the people in utilities that are buying a lot of this stuff aren't aware that that's you know probably not a selling point you know. So, so um, in all of this stuff, uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure that's been there for right very long time, um, for decades, and with the uh, advancement of wireless technology over the, like, the last 15 years, um, it's really become the fastest and easiest way to link up all these remote sites across, say, a city or a state. Um, it's actually really expensive, right, to run lines out to every single device that may be, um, you know, in a given area. And so what we've seen is that for a lot of actually good reasons, um, for, you know, for overall cost and some of these types of things and e ease of deployment, um, wireless is everywhere. So uh, pretty much anything that you could hook up with a wire has been hooked up with wireless at some utility or another. Right? Yeah, and, and a lot of this, you know, specifically to, to where smart grid kind of comes into play is that, you know, and, and we we'll talk about that kind of further in as well. Is that there's a lot of rapid push to get a lot of these things out. So there, there's a lot of things that you know traditionally might have been wired or, or might have just been you know something that required physical access to that they now want to get plugged into everything else and tied in together. And so the, yeah, the fastest path to do that is is some kind of wireless tech. Yeah. 
And, and so just kind of defining some terms and things like that. Um, you'll, you'll hear the term AMI a lot, you know, advanced metering infrastructure. Um, more commonly and actually more pervasive is, is going to be something called AMR, um, you know, which is really just a meter read type technology, automated meter read. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that most of us probably have you know, out on our, our house. And, and so if you look at your meter and it says cell net or something like that, um, it, a lot of those are just one-way reads. And so like in the case of my utility, um, what they do is they, you know, they just roll trucks around the neighborhood and via pager net stuff will like go out and, and just pull read data from the meters. And so they're not walking around anymore. Um, the, the next wave of that obviously and what, what you're seeing in, in the other different parts of the country is and being adapted pretty rapidly is more AMI. So then you're talking about two-way communication, you're talking about you know, data coming from the home um, you know, to the meter and upstream. Yeah, AMR was what you saw utilities doing, say, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of the natural progression where it was going, where it was the, uh, the easy way to sort of start stepping into this uh, you know, more advanced world of uh, digital reads and being able to um, lessen the number of people you had to actually send out to houses. Uh, with the push from, say, uh, stimulus money, there was a lot of that that was tagged on to uh, smart grid infrastructure. And a lot of that has pushed in various regional markets around the US um, rapid adoption of advanced metering infrastructure. So like mm -hmm. the, the full scale stuff with um, all the bells and whistles rather than just the reads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and as far as the technologies that are in use, you're going to see you're going to see a lot of proprietary RF, uh, usually on uh, the ISM, which institutional scientific and medical band, which is it is the same band that you'll see, um, you know, a, a lot of other a lot of other traffic that's kind of like this, but that's uh, that's the 900 megahertz band. Um, yeah, and we got into various discussions with, uh, with RF engineers and some people that, that understood why a lot of these decisions were made. And um, you know, we like to bash on, on proprietary protocols from time to time, um, but outside of the fact that it's closed and we, we don't really understand always how they work, um, there actually were some really good reasons why they did what they did. Uh, the type of environment that they were in of, you know, Envision, you've got to send very, very small amounts of information, right? It's like you know, a command to do this or that, or an acknowledgement, or maybe, you know, here's how much electricity I've used, or whatever. So very, very small amounts of information that doesn't have to go very often, right? So really what you need is you just need low throughput, and you need it to be able to go a long ways and be able to get through, like, brick walls and, you know, all these kinds of awful things. So as a result, most of these guys created their own sort of mesh networking stuff that's all proprietary RF that, you know, didn't exist out there as an open standard, so mm -hmm. they went to this. Yeah. Uh, with a couple of exceptions. Yeah, and a lot of this predates um, you know, predates actually Smart Grid and all these other things. So these were companies that were around that were kind of a niche market for some of this kind of stuff before. So they had all this tech that integrated with other types of SCADA systems and all this other stuff. And now those companies are sort of already in that market, already equipped. So now they're they're pushing out this tech. Yeah. So a lot of the things that we've looked at, you know, on meters and stuff, that's you know that the actual radio tech and things is sometimes 10 and 15 years old. Yeah, and and at the end of the day, right? The whole point of a lot of this stuff is that most of it's all just either an evolution of what was there before or it's literally a bolt-on to what was there before. So at the end, right, you're talking SCADA protocols that are either over IP or over, you know, some sort of custom RF, um, but it's all still SCADA under the hood and it's usually, you know, you start pulling these devices apart and you can usually find where, it, like, oh, that's actually a serial connection, like, right there. That, that's just, you know, yeah. I know what that is. I can tap into that. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as some of the other tech, uh, you know, obviously, some of these things are actually on, you know, currently on nailed, nailed WANs, and so these are actually like, you know, a T1 that's going, you know, from a, a substation or, or a, you know, a, a plant, you know, back to some central point where they do control of it. And of course, that's very expensive, right? A, nail, a nailed T1 circuit's, you know, you know say a thousand bucks a month or whatever. Uh, but that's that's what sort of existed, you know, originally. And some of these things will be like dial-up lines. Uh, what we're seeing more of, you know, lately is actually WiMAX technology. Um, and it's not the same, you know, it's not the same WiMAX that you see with, like, say, Clear. Um, you know, typically it's on different frequencies, and this is not, you know, obviously not Clear Tech's not designed to be public. It has some of the same problems as, as other WiMAX technology. Um, the Zigbee stuff, which you'll probably hear, you probably hear a fair bit about. Um, you know, Zigbee is essentially a reduced version of 802.11. Um, and then also, like we mentioned earlier, some of these things are on cellular, so EVDO and, and CDMA. And actually, there are meter vendors out there that, uh, and not just meter actually, but distribution automation vendors and, and things that, that support Wi-Fi. So straight up Wi-Fi, you know, um, they'll, they'll do it. You can plug a, <laughs> you can plug a wireless NIC and an AP and, and send this stuff over that. 
um, shouldn't shouldn't be a problem at all. I think it's a fantastic idea. So, <laughs> yeah. And um, other uh, other terms that you'll see, um, Han and Non down here at the bottom, specifically within the smart grid realm, that's talking about home area networks and neighborhood area networks. Home area networks are the the smart grid stuff. Like you can have a device in your house that'll tell you, that like talks to your meter or talks to some other device that'll tell you, you know, you're using this many kilowatt hours, and you know we expect your monthly bill to be blah. Mm -hmm. And then they can also get messages down from utilities so they can tell you, you know, hey. Um, uh, in the future when uh, pricing is going to fluctuate more than it does right now, they can tell you like, hey, we're anticipating high demand on this day or whatever, so it's going to cost more, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the neighborhood area networks are the stuff that mesh all of that together. So uh, those can be um, both the, the things that will um, link up uh, uh, like, yeah, like switching st or substations and, and some of those other outside things, but primarily when, when it's talked about, it's um, the, the network that hooks up all the meters in a given area and then pipes that back up to you know, some location. Yeah, and obviously backhaul is just, you know, think the same thing as your ISP. You might have, you might, might have a bunch of, you know, bunch of neighborhoods that have, uh, you know, say cable modems or whatever, and there are, there's, you know, there's a CO or some point where all of those come together to a, you know, to a backhaul. So the, the neighborhood area networks, there's some collection point that then runs all that stuff upstream via a little bit bigger pipe. And that's also where some of the, the, uh, the actual management traffic and things is going to come out of. Some of that's out of band, some of that's actually in band. You know, so you're going to see that, uh, you know, if you have access to, to see meter traffic or other traffic, you'll see the management stuff going across that as well. Um, like, Nathan, like Nathan said, somewhere under the hood here, it, it typically is something that is really SCADA over IP. So it's, at, at some point you're taking a SCADA protocol, you're turning it into IP, some device, some endpoint is then taking that and turning it back into serial. So it's going to be RS-45 or RS-232 serial under the hood somewhere. Yeah, and just, yeah, just a map of, of the level of adoption, the stuff that we're seeing right now in our part of the, this part of the globe. Um, there's the, the places where you're seeing a lot of the AMI, like we mentioned, are, are in particular a lot of the people that have got uh, the stimulus funding, and that's pushing a lot of that. Um, as I think a lot of people know, Pacific Gas and Electric and in California have been, uh, you know, the biggest deployer of that. Uh, but there's there's lots of other big utilities that are moving this way. So at the end of the day, what what, what do we have? Uh, we've got network devices, right, that are talking this RF stuff that then you've given to every single person out there. Right? That every person that has this particular technology in their area um, has these things bolted onto their house and onto random buildings around town and whatnot. So if in that type of scenario you're dealing with um, a, a very hard problem to protect, right? You try to think about um, like uh, uh, some of the people that have, that have had to protect things in that type of space, like I give you a device or I give you a piece of technology and you're not supposed to be able to pull it apart and how hard that is and how well that works, right? Well in this environment I mean, if, if you wanted to go like steal one off the side of a house somewhere um, or off a building uh, and you have physical access to it and you have, you know, an extended period of time to work with this, you have access to the network. And it really needs to be viewed that way. That you've got to expect that um, at some point individuals will be able to gain access to that network. It's just, it's, it's impossible to, uh, to be able to ad adequately block that well. So um, there's lots of different ways that can be done, right, no, no matter what you, if you've got uh, hardcore encryption and all these other things going on, um, there are too many ways into that type of a system. Yeah. Right? So there's lots of other talks here and previous years talking about how to do that at the hardware level. You know, we reference you know, Goodspeed, Davis, some of those guys. Um, all yeah. great work. Yeah, and, and you know, we, made, we make the point a lot of times when we've talked to utilities about this that it's a lot like the problem that content providers have with DRM or uh, you know, satellite companies with, with pay-per-view and things like that. So, these devices have you know, an expected lifetime of 10 and 15 years, right? And so even if they have like really awesome, super awesome crypto and all these other things, like they have the ability to interact with the network by definition. And even if you try to you know, protect some of that, at the end of the day, the consumer has the means to join that network and they have access to the device. Just like with the satellite stuff, if one person you know, breaks the encryption and releases the information, right? So, you know, if everybody knows, I don't know, if nobody has a dream box here or does any of that stuff, right? That's, you know, not at all. Uh, it doesn't, I don't, you know, if I participate in the sat hacking stuff, you know, I don't have to be the guy who's got the latest codes that work. I just have to go to the forum where somebody else has posted. So, it's the same kind of thing. Once one person in a given area has, has